Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those for whom people hid their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. <clears throat> Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and one who had thought any more of his destiny. When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice set me free. Into your hands I commend my spirit. It is you who will redeem me, Lord. 
Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. In the face of all my foes, I am a reproach, an object of scorn to my neighbors and of fear to my friends. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Those who see me in the street run far away from me. I am like a dead man forgotten, like a thing thrown away. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But as for me, I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My life is in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of those who hate me. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your love. Be strong, let your heart take courage, all who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what, was, from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise and honor to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Praise and honor to you, O Lord Jesus Christ. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, because of the The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. 
Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he had said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper's gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there, keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why, ask me, ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. 
But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, what charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, we do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say, I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner over to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out, out to you 
so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have our law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now Pilate heard this statement. He became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you? and I have power to crucify you. Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement in Hebrew Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews and said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be, in order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. 
This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a spring of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the Spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you may also come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, but, fear of, but for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial clothes along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there, and because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Good Friday forms, as it were, the second movement of the Triduum, the Sacred Three Days, because liturgically the Sacred Three Days are one. They're not three separate liturgies, but one liturgy that begins on Holy Thursday and ends with the vigil on Holy Saturday night. And so this is the second part. It's the reason why yesterday we did not end by saying the Mass is ended, go in peace, and why today we did not have the regular opening hymn and antiphons and things that mark the beginning of Mass. The original Good Friday, the first Good Friday, the Friday of the crucifixion of the Lord was in a sense a second movement for the disciples as well. We could say that the first movement was their meeting Jesus and their accompanying him, their decision to become his disciples. Anyone who had seen them walking around the streets of Galilee behind this rabbi, if they had asked them, are you his disciples, they would have said, yes, we're his disciples. But that first movement was marked, as we see in the Gospels, on their part by a lot of confusion and a lot of self-centeredness and self-concern. It's the reason why we see them sometimes arguing with the crowds, why we see them sometimes arguing with one another about who's going to be the first in the kingdom and who's the best among them. They don't want to hear anything about suffering, and they reject the idea of crucifixion outright. Often Jesus is teaching things that they're not understanding. They're worried about food and where the next meal is going to come from. They're worried about money and the people they've left behind. They're preoccupied with themselves, even though they're with Jesus. They are his disciples. He is their master, but they're focused a lot on themselves. What begins the second movement is the disaster of the arrest in the garden, the absolute calamity of seeing Jesus scourged, tried in a sham trial, crucified publicly as a criminal, and die. The second movement is so horrifying to them, it causes tremendous confusion. It causes tremendous fear. It causes them to flee, to hide, afraid now to tell anyone that they even know who Jesus is. Peter, the head of the apostles, denies him three times. But then there is a third movement, the one that we celebrate tomorrow, the one that we live in, the Easter movement, the movement that sees that unbelievably good news, so good that they in fact won't believe it, they don't believe it. Jesus told them he was going to rise, but they don't stay at the tomb watching to see that great event because they don't believe that it, it's going to happen. They don't understand what he means when he says it. And yet they receive the good news from the women who tell them that in fact the tomb is empty and then they see that with their own eyes. And their lives are forever changed they don't go back to what they were doing before. After Jesus' resurrection, after his further days with them, after his ascension, they go forward in their Easter faith, now no longer focused on themselves, now no longer worrying about themselves, now focused on him and what they can do to spread the good news to all that the Lord has risen.
I was thinking about these three movements in light of this year's celebration of the Triduum, this year of COVID-19 celebration of the Triduum, this year when we celebrate the Triduum in empty churches before cameras and lights and equipment, knowing that the faithful are at home praying there. We too have had a first movement. Do you remember what you were thinking two months ago, three months ago? Do you remember what your life was like before pandemic? Do you remember the things that you worried about? Do you remember the things that you took for granted, the things that you were absolutely certain about, the things that seemed the most important to you? Perhaps a lot of that was focused on ourselves. There are ways in which we get trapped in our own mind and our own worries. We forget sometimes about other people, about other concerns. But then a disaster struck us as well, this worldwide pandemic. It was hard at first to understand, what does it mean? Is it real? Does it really happening? We were confused. But as the truth begins to sink in, as the death counts mounted, we began to see this is a tragedy that we are all caught in, all of us together as a worldwide human family are caught together in this tragedy trying to save as many of our brothers and sisters as we can by the way we live our own lives, by this social distancing and all of these safety protocols that we've put in place. That's our second movement when now we are fearful and anxious and wondering what's going to come next. Well, we know what's going to come next. We celebrate tomorrow night what is coming next, what we live in, what has come into the world. The good news, the amazing good news that Jesus has risen. And our lives need not ever be the same again either. Now it's time for us as the disciples of old, to not go back to our lives as they were before, but to go forward with our lives completely, entirely given, dedicated, focused on Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one whose resurrection saves us, the one whose love gives us hope, to live for him, to give ourselves to him, to be obedient to him, to repent of the past, and to move forward to the future with hope, the hope that comes to us from an empty tomb. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her, 
throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray also for our Bishop David, for our bishops, priests, and deacons of the third, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayers for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ, Jesus our Lord. Let us heal. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, 
who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring. Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us heal. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people <clears throat> to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Let us heal. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us heal.
let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us heal. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion, may through your gift be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, and the heart prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us heal. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for a swift end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father will heal the sick, strengthen those who care for them, and help us all to persevere in faith. Let us heal. Let us turn. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing. Look with compassion on our world brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, 
strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us worship. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
And let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.